Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So great. so great to see you here this morning. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with us. We have several announcements this morning. Uh, they're listed in your bulletin there. Uh, there is going to be a church picnic on June 5th. Uh, more details will be coming out <coughs> about that, but uh, Brown Chicken. <laughs> the other thing is that on that same day there will be a, a nominating committee report. Uh, you'll see in the bulletin that I've been nominated to be an elder to replace uh, John Dickey, the elder emeritus. You'll also notice in that that you can have nominations from the school. It's not going to hurt my feelings whatsoever <laughs> if there are any nominations from the board. The, I don't believe there are any other, oh, there is one other. A Bible study group is going to be starting on June 6th. Nancy's going to be uh, handling a Bible study group on the Gospel of John in the evenings on Monday. So keep that on your calendar also. The flowers this morning are given by Samuel and Mae Young Koo. They couldn't be here today. Mae Young is up. Uh, she's actually being a judge for another cello concert, national cello concert. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's up in New York.
And Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us in your word, that we discover so much as we read your, your word in the Bible, your story, the story of Jesus. And we ask that as uh, each of these youth, Elijah and Logan and Alice and Elise, as they begin to, to open these books and to read these words, that your story would come alive for them, and that they would know Jesus as the one who loves them. And Lord, we just thank you for that. We ask that you would bless these fathers and bless these children and their families. In Christ's name. Be still, for God loves you and forgives. 
of it, receive the peace of Christ. Please be seated. So for our children's message this morning, you don't even have to move. Just stay right where you are. Does anybody remember the word from last week? Started with an R. Alice. Random. Remember that word? Okay. It's Saturday night. You want to have a sleepover. But if there's a sleepover at your house on Saturday night, that means you come to church on Sunday morning. And your friend has never been to church. Doesn't know anything about God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit. But your friend knows one super important thing. Your friend knows that you are a good, safe, loving person. So they are willing to come into this brand new situation. You and your friend come in, you sit down in the pew, who does this? Friends looking everywhere. And then you feel elbows in your rib cage. And your friend says, wow, you people really like your fruit. <laughs> what do you think your friend has noticed? The stained glass window. And what about the stained glass window, Alice? You see fruit? Grapes. All right. Now we know that things in this space are not random, right? They all tell a story. So you look at your friend and you say, Do you want to hear the story of the grapes? Now, if your friend says no, you go, Okay, that's fine. We respect people and what they want to hear and what they don't hear. But if your friend says yes, then it's your turn to tell some of the story of Jesus. I know. Now, you don't have to tell the whole Bible at one, in one long whisper. Okay? You only have to tell a little bit. So what you can say is, so Jesus was a part of God's plan for the whole world. And one time he was with his friends, and he had this really special meal with his friends. And he took a loaf of bread, and he took a cup that was filled with wine, and wine is made with grapes. And he held them up, and he said, this is like my body, this bread. And this cup, this wine is like my, my blood. So if you put body and blood, you put the whole thing together, you have all of Jesus. And Jesus is saying to his friends, look, all of me loves you. All of me loves you. And Jesus says to us, use all of you to love people too. So those grapes are not random. They're a part of our story. And any time you come in this space and somebody feels loved enough to listen, you have all these teaching tools around you to help tell Jesus' story. Yeah. All we have to do is love people enough that they feel safe to listen. Can we pray? Can you put your hands like this for me? Great, thank you. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to close your eyes. Dear God, thank you for this church. Help us to love people so much that they want to hear your story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I go further, I want everybody to know that there's a new laborer sitting in the middle of the second row right here. <laughs> it was quite enthusiastic. You'll <laughs> 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 be up here. The prayer for illumination this morning. Living God, you sent your apostle to preach the gospel 
old women gathered by the river in a secluded place of prayer. There is a businesswoman named Lydia who was led by the Spirit to hear your word as truth. She opened her heart in love and she opened her home for the spreading of the gospel. By the power of your Holy Spirit, fling wide the doors of our hearts this day as we hear your word of life, that we too may open our lives to serve your world in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We are a creedal church, the Presbyterians, and we have a book of confessions. And one of those confessions, I believe the most recent written in 1983, we read this, in life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. As people who put our faith in Jesus, we have a particular identity. We are sheep of the Good Shepherd, and we are children of God. But in our individualistic culture, where we affirm over and over again our individual rights, when we hear we are not our own, we belong to God, sometimes we want to push back against that, thinking, I want to be my own person. I don't want to have to do a certain way. But we belong to God. That's good news. That's our hope. Yes, God owns us. And we are to live for God. But this one who owns us loves us greatly. Enough to die for us. Max Lucado tells this story. Longing to leave her poor Brazilian neighborhood Christina wanted to see the world. Discontent with a home having only a pallet on the floor, a wash basin, and a wood burning stove, she dreamed of a better life in the city. So one morning, she slipped away, breaking her mother's heart. Knowing what life on the streets would be like for her young, attractive daughter, Maria hurried and packed to go find her. On her way to the bus stop, she entered a drugstore to get one last thing. Pictures. She sat in the photograph booth and took picture after picture of herself. And then spent all afternoon uh, getting these pictures together for her daughter. With her purse full of small black and white photo booth pictures, she boarded the bus to Rio de Janeiro. She knew that Christina had no way of earning money. She also knew that her daughter was too stubborn to give up. When pride meets hunger, a human will do things that were unthinkable before. Knowing this, she began her search. She went to all the places she didn't want her daughter to be. Bars and hotels and nightclubs and any place with that kind of reputation. She went to them all. And at each place, she left her picture taped on a bathroom mirror, a bulletin board, a corner phone booth. And on the back of each picture, she left a note. It wasn't long before her money ran out and she had to return home. She wept as the bus began its long journey back to her small village. A few weeks later, young Christina came down from a room of the hotel, down the stairs. Her face was tired and worn. Her eyes no longer danced with the joy of youth but with the pain of what she was enduring. Her laughter was broken. Her dream had become a nightmare. A thousand times over, she had longed to trade these nights for that pallet on the floor with her mother. Yet the village was, in many ways, too far away. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, she noticed a familiar face in front of her. She looked again, and there on the lobby mirror was a picture of her mother. 
Her eyes burned and her throat tightened as she walked across the room and removed the picture from the mirror. Written on the back was a compelling note. Whatever you have done, whatever you have become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. She did. Whatever you have done, whatever you have become, it doesn't matter. This is the love of the one to whom we belong, which makes it a good thing that we are not our own, but we belong to God. To be so loved, that is our identity. An identity that is ours 24-7. Knowing God's love as we receive grace. The words in Ephesians are central to our Christian faith. It is one that we hold dear. It is all about God's great love for us. And the grace that we receive because of that love. Saved from that dead condition and brought into a new life in Christ. We were dead in sin and transgressions. Mark Roberts talks of zombies. Sometimes I have been so tired that I, that I was like a zombie. I remember as a young person where we would go and stay out late and get up early. And while I'm actually alive and living, I'm sort of dead. We are alive, but dead when we are separate from Christ, separated from God. And all the ways that we try to find life, to fill the void, all of the things that we might do cannot give us life. Great works, decadence, pampering ourselves with every luxury, with every good gift that we can buy, looking for love and affection in different relationships, being almost perfect, whatever our effort, it doesn't and can't make us alive. But God, God being rich in mercy because of his great love for us, intervened. I think of the Hebrew story where the people were in bondage and they were being mistreated and they were slaves and they cried out to God for help. And God intervened. In our case, no one else did it. No one else could do it. God did it. For us, what did he do? He made us alive in Christ. Alive. We are new creations, new creatures. In our hearts, we are reborn and changed. And we are alive in Christ. God has given us life, life we do not deserve, and life we cannot earn. In the book Proof, Timothy Paul tells this story. It's an interesting and a bit of a strange story, but it's a, it's a good read. I never dreamed that taking a child to Disney World could be so difficult. Or that such a trip could teach me so much about God's outrageous grace. Our middle, middle daughter had been previously adopted by another family. I am sure this couple had the best of intentions, but after a couple of rough years, they dissolved the adoption, and we ended up welcoming an eight-year-old into our for one reason or another, 
Whenever our daughter's previous family would go to Disney World, they would take their biological children, but not their adopted daughter. They would leave her with a family friend. Usually, at least in this child's mind, this happened because she did something wrong that precluded her presence on this trip. By the time we adopted our daughter, she had seen many pictures of Disney World, heard about the rides and the characters and the parades, but when it came to passing through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, she had always been the one left out. So I made plans to take her to Disney World the next time a speaking engagement took me and our family to the southeastern United States. I knew from previous experience that the prospect of seeing cast members in freakishly oversized mouse and duck costumes somehow turns children into squirming bundles of emotion. But what I didn't expect was that the prospect of visiting this dream world would produce a stream of downright devilish behavior in our newest daughter. In the month leading up to our trip to the Magic Kingdom, she stole food when a simple request would have given her food. She lied when it would have been easier to tell the truth. She whispered insults. And as the days on the calendar moved closer to the trip, her mutinies multiplied. A couple of days before our family headed to Florida, I pulled our little daughter into my lap, and I talked to her about her latest misbehavior. I know what you're trying to do, she said flatly. You're not going to take me to Disney, are you? Well, the thought hadn't actually crossed my mind. <laughs> but her downward spiral suddenly started to make some sense. She knew she couldn't earn her way to the Magic Kingdom. She had tried and failed that test many times before. So she was living in a way that placed her as far as possible from that magical place on earth. In retrospect, I'm embarrassed to admit that in that moment, I was tempted to turn her fear to my own advantage. The easiest response would have been to say, if you don't start behaving better, you're right, you're not going to go. But by God's grace, I didn't. Instead, I asked her, is this trip something we're doing as a family? She nodded with her eyes numbing with tears. Are you part of this family, I asked. She nodded again. Then you're going with us. Sure, there might be some consequences to help you remember what's right and what's wrong, but you're part of our family, and we're not leaving you behind. I'd like to say that her behavior got better after that moment. They didn't. <laughs> her choices pretty much spiraled out of control at every hotel and rest stop all the way to Lake Buena Vista in Florida. Still, we headed to Disney World on the day we had promised, and it was a typical Disney day. Overpriced tickets, overpriced meals, lots of lines, all mingled with just enough manufactured magic to consider maybe going again someday. <laughs> and at her hotel room that evening, a very different child emerged. She was exhausted pensive, and a little weepy at times. 
But her month-long facade of rebellion had faded. When bedtime rolled around, I prayed with her, held her, and asked, So how was your first day at Disney World? She closed her eyes and snuggled down into her stuffed unicorn. After a few moments, she opened her eyes ever so slightly and said, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disney World. But it wasn't because I was good. It was because I'm yours. It wasn't because I was good. It was because I'm yours. God's grace has claimed us as his own, and by his grace, we belong to God. Not because we are good, but because I'm yours. God rewrites our stories by his grace and gives us new life, and that is who we are. In this new life, we are to do something. Listen to verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. In our new life, we are to do something, not to earn our salvation. That was done in Christ. Not saved by works, but saved for works. And what are those works to be? All that we do and say, the whole of our lives, is to be for God. We are to live our whole life for the praise of his glory. Everything we do for God's purposes. As Calvin puts it in his Institutes, when he talks about we belong to God. We are not our own. Let not our reason nor our will, therefore, sway our plans and deeds. We are not our own. Let us therefore not set it as our goal to seek what is expedient for us according to the flesh. We are not our own. In so far as we can, let us therefore forget ourselves and all that is ours. Conversely, we are God's. Let us therefore live for him and die for him. We are God's. Let his wisdom and will, therefore, rule our actions. We are God's. Let all the parts of our life accordingly strive toward him as our only lawful goal. Who are we? We are a people so loved by God that he died for us. We are a people brought into the family of God forever by God's act of grace. We belong to God, not just here for a few minutes, but as a way of life. When we leave this place, our identity goes with us. It does not change. We carry it with us. We must live and act as the people of God. Amen. This morning we are doing something special after the sermon. We're going to um, affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed and the Lord's Prayer. And our Sunday school youth are going to come and lead us in this as we together profess what we believe. And you can remain seated as we do this together. So what is the affirmation of faith and then the Lord's prayer? Let us affirm 
from what we believe. I believe in the God of
as we come to a time of prayer, um, I, if you have prayer concerns, um, I would love for you to share this at this time of these special needs. Let us pray, God. Gracious God, we thank you for your goodness to us, which we experience in so many ways, but most particularly through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who brings us into new life to serve you. And we thank you for the privilege that that is, that we can be called children of and we thank you for the gift of community as we gather here today. We are blessed and encouraged by those who sit beside us, in front of us, behind us, and around us. Help us to reach out to one another and to be a blessing as we seek to live as your people. But we thank you for this special place where you have brought us to be in this little town of Kilmarnock and this county, this peninsula. And Lord, we thank you for the, for the opportunities that we have to live as your people and to share your good news, to share the love of Christ with the people that we meet in the many places where we find ourselves. Help us to be a blessing. Help us to hear you as you lead us to be your people. But oh God, we pray for those with special needs. In our church, there are many. And we pray for Ethel. And we pray for the family of Bill Grant, for Dick and Dottie for Jack, <coughs> for Robert, for Paul. We pray for Jim and for Sue and Nancy and Jean and Charlie. Lord, there are those with special needs this week. We ask that you would be with them, whether it's a work situation or a medical crisis <coughs> or a relationship. Lord, for all those who are hurting in different ways, we pray that your hand would be upon them and that they would know that you are the divine physician and the great comforter and our power and our strength. Lord, we pray for our extended family. We ask that where there are special needs that you would be there. Or some of those needs are such that we don't mention them. But you know, we ask that you would intervene as we have known you to intervene for us. Lord, be with the leaders of our church. Equip them with every gift that we might serve you faithfully and they might lead us in your ways. Now all these things we pray in Christ's name. We pray and we pray in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. This morning as we gather one of our privileges, we sometimes think of it as a responsibility, but our privileges to offer ourselves to God, to offer our time and our talents and our treasures. So we take a minute and we think about that and how we offer ourselves to God and what we might give. We have an offering plate at the back that will dedicate those gifts in just a minute. But it's not just the offering plate we welcome your gifts, but what might God be asking of you? Let us take a minute and pause and think about those gifts.
of that, but we ask that you would take our offerings, our time, our talents, our treasures, that you would take what we offer and that you would multiply it, even as you multiply the fish by the lake, that you would use it for your purpose, that the love of Christ would be heard and known. Amen. As you go out today, go out as the people of God and take the love of Christ to the people you meet. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of God's Holy Spirit be with you now and always.